start in May. Just watch monthly meeting. It is May, right? Right. Losing track of time. Gosh, it's not my guy. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Um, I'm Maria Mark. I'm president of Beaches Watch and your host for tonight. Um, we really want to thank LaToya uh, for hosting us here at the Carver Center. Um, if you don't know anything about the Carver Center, who doesn't know anything about the Carver Center? They have all kinds of programs, after school programs for kids, and line dancing going on over there, which I thought was really cool. I think we finish early, we can go do some line dancing. Um, but they, they do a lot to support, particularly our, our children um, after school and kids and that sort of thing. So we thank them for letting us use their space. The library, as you probably know, uh, we're doing early voting there, so we were kicked out for this month. However, this is a great space, so thanks again. Um, so just a few announcements before we get to our program tonight. Um, so our meetings are always videotaped uh, and uh, will be on our website and our YouTube channel tomorrow. So please share the link with your friends and neighbors who are not able to make it tonight um, as we're talking about the state of our river and, and um, which is one of our greatest assets here. And so we're really happy to have Dr. Pinto and Lisa Rodman, your Riverkeeper, uh, here to do the presentation. Um, so we are a membership-based organization. Um, our memberships are $15 for individuals, $20 for family, and $5 for students. Uh, it's an annual membership, and so we ask that you either think about renewing or joining our, our uh, organization and or donating. We always like to take money. We never say no to money. Um, I did not uh, elected officials, recognition of elected officials. So we have Carrie Chen from Neptune Beach. Uh, We're going to let her guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My cheat sheet here. Uh, Greg Sutton, City of Jacksonville Beach. <laughs> and Sandy Golding, uh, City of Jacksonville Beach. And I will <coughs> recognize Kevin Camp, who's also on our board, but um, as the Deputy City Manager of the Landing Beach. So. like it's going to be the fourth Wednesdays of the month at 6 p.m. located in our chambers um, and it's open to the public and we really encourage anyone who's from Atlantic Beach to please attend the meetings. This is really important. It's our charter review um, so we want to make sure we get our public input for that. Um, Jacksonville election dates are last, the last day to vote by mail or vote by mail is May 6th. Is May request, 6th. request vote by mail. Oh, request by mail. Oh, request for mail, May 6th. Um, and you can see where to request that, duvalelections.com. Early voting is going on now through the 14th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at our Beaches Branch Library. Um, and then, of course, election day is May 16th. So vote early or vote often. No, <laughs> Jacksonville election information, as you are all probably aware. Mayor, we have our two candidates, uh, Daniel Davis and Donna Deegan. Uh, our at-large group one is uh, Charles Garrison and Chris Miller. Sorry, group no. five. It's group five. Oh, oh folks. sorry. Faux pas. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. Group five. Five. Charles Garrison and Chris Miller. And then property appraiser, we have um, Jason Fisher and Joyce Morgan. Um, as you know, or as you may or may not know, we held the mayoral candidate forum recently. Uh, so that also was recorded, and you can watch that video on our uh, website, beacheswatch.com. Well attended. The candidates were very um, personable, very forthcoming. I think uh, our feedback on that was we had some very interesting questions, aside from the normal questions that they had been answering. So 
uh, please check that out and share that with your friends and neighbors as well. Um, you've probably heard about the Jacksonville Beach hike referendum that's on the ballot. Uh, again, we held a, a panel discussion about that, so please um, look at that at our, our uh, website there, JB hike referendum, and uh, again, that's going to be on the May 16 ballot. Okay, so coming up June 7th, can you believe we're in June coming up? Save the date, this is our 2023 legislative session recap. Um, we are going to have the city manager from Jacksonville Beach as our speaker for that. He has been confirmed. Um, he's been very much involved in what's been going on in Tallahassee. So uh, please put that on your day, on your calendar. And we will be back in the library for that meeting. Yay. And there's been a lot of stuff going on in Tallahassee. So A lot. Yeah. A lot of stuff. And you're not safe yet. They no, are, it's not been called home yet. It's not over there. We're not yeah. safe yet. We had some minor reprieves, but you know, who knows? It's not. It's not over. So, um, so that that should be a really informative uh, and enlightening meeting. Okay. Do we have any other announcements? Anything else anyone wants to share with the group? Okay. Well, I'm happy to present as our guest speakers. Um, not in this order that's on here, because we're going to have Dr. Jerry Pinto start. Um, he is the Associate Research Scientist at the Marine Science Research Institute at Jacksonville University. And following will be Lisa Reinemann, your, our, St. John's River Keeper. Um, and so we will, we'll have Q&A after the presentations. Okay. So, let me now do my...
And on the right here are some of the people that have been involved in the report in the past. Some of them are still in, involved in the report. We go to them for guidance, for leadership, for uh, advice, but you know, we continue to do that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, SJRReport.com. So if you want to check this out on the, on the, on the online, the Google SJRReport.com. I'm only going to cover a little bit today because there's only, I only have 15 minutes. Uh, there's too much in this report. It's almost 300 pages. There's too much in this report to kind of cover it all. Uh, but generally, you can see that there is a highlight section. And John Burr, uh, an acclaimed uh, <coughs> editor for the Times Union in the past and other things, uh, wrote that this year, or, that, or this last year, the, the 2022 number. Uh, he talks about flooding, he talks about climate change, he talks about heat, uh, a lot of things that are exacerbated by, by climate change. And things that we need to consider going forward but as we do our resiliency strategy for the city. Um, there's a background section, so it looks at the environmental history of the St. John's River. There's a water quality section, and I'm going to focus mainly on that today. And then we have a fishery section, a aquatic life section, and a contaminant section. Um, there's also a brochure. I think some of you have already picked up the brochure that was out there. That sort of gives you a very brief summary of everything. Um, and then we have a website. And on the website, we have a lot more maps and all kinds of <coughs> educational resources and those kinds of things that, that are available to school teachers. And so. um, let's go to the next slide. Slide. I'm going to skip some of these slides as I've already mentioned. So this is kind of this is what the website looks like if you go to it. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that uh, you can search for things by council district and planning district over here on the bottom right. There's also a tab that will take you to tributaries in the St. John's River. So if you go to the next slide, it's kind of if you click on the tributaries, you'll see that there are about 29 tributaries there that have uh, tables and data that's collected on those tributaries and gives you an assessment of any kind of things called TMDLs or BMAPs. These are total maximum daily loads. Uh, and um, BMAPs are basin management action plans to try to achieve those TMDLs. Uh, so those are projects that various agencies, go to the next slide, various agencies do um, that try to achieve those uh, management decisions. Uh, just a brief view of uh, some of the parameters we look at. Uh, on the left there, salinity. Uh, looking at salinity of the long term, we have sea levels that have risen about an inch per decade since the 1930s. Those, that rise in sea levels puts pressure on an aquifer. Uh, it puts pressure on salt water moving up the estuary. So areas that were once fresh, where the cedar trees were, and grass beds are, are being affected by increasing salinity over the long term. If you look at salinity since 2017, what happened in 2017? We had an urban right, and we had a number of storms that made conditions very fresh in the river. Um, those conditions under normal circumstances would be great for grass bed growth, the SAV, the submersion by vegetation that the manatees love to eat, the fish use as habitat uh, for many larval stages and that kind of thing. It would normally th thrive when you have a lot of fresh conditions. Uh, but those storms were really vigorous. They ripped up those grass beds. They destroyed them. Um, and so they haven't bounced back very well. Very well. And so I think Lisa and I will talk a little bit more about that and what, what some of the possible solutions to that are. Uh, we have uh, big problems with FIB, fe fecal indicator bacteria, we call it. And so this is from sewage. Uh, that comes from septic tanks, or failing infrastructure pipes, or biosolids uh, being land applied that then all that stuff washes into the water system, eventually ending up in the river. Um, most of our tributaries are unsatisfactory. They exceed those levels of fecal bacteria by 100% in some cases. Uh, the best one, I think, is Ortega River at 21% exceedance. So they're all, they're all badly affected. Um, turbidity is you know, the, the cloudiness of the water, where the 
it's silt turbidity or algae turbidity. We're interested in that because when we do dredging in the river, we churn stuff up, and so that makes things cloudy, and the light can't penetrate, and the grasses or anything that's, that's plant-like that needs light to survive and grow can't get it and dies out. And so we're interested in that, but uh, we've noticed that turbidity has been fairly satisfactory in spite of all the Dissolved oxygen, a couple of things going on there. The main stem of the river seems to be fine. It's the tributaries that get very hot in the summer. In some periods of time, it gets very hot. And as you know, when water gets hot, its oxygen carrying capacity, of course, is much less. Um, and so we have a lot of problems with low oxygen in the, in the tributaries. So that means you can get fish kills and you can get all kinds of anoxic, low oxygen conditions. Uh, that, that are bad. But one of the things about that too is phosphorus is more available when you have low oxygen. And one of the problems in the tributaries is high, is, is high phosphorus. And why is that important? Well, nitrogen and phosphorus, of course, you've heard about fertilizer, right? Those are the food for algae. Uh, and so that's something that's all connected. All this stuff is connected uh, and relates to each other. Um, Algae blooms, we have a high frequency of algae blooms when the temperatures get warm. Right about now, uh, as, as the temperatures are increasing, we're going to start to see algae blooms uh, in the river. What we're concerned about mostly is are they harmful algae blooms? We call them PAPs, harmful algae blooms. Do they, have, do they produce toxins? Um, those toxins are usually things like microcystis, that is a liver toxin and, and can be detrimental and other animals. Um, for the most part, our algae uh, analysis and, and data collection is flawed because we're not capturing all those blooms and all those events. And this, these algae are pretty smart too, right? They kind of uh, do their own thing. You might be sampling at this level in the water and the algae is down here. And you might go down there to sample down there and they go up here. And so you're missing some, a lot of information. So we need to do a lot of uh, changes to our algae sampling uh, to try to target areas that are problematic, first of all, and then also do some profile studies so we can actually look at the, the whole water column. Um, and then, of course, there's de there are delays in processing that data and getting information back where you know, oh, this algae is toxic. But wait a minute, I've been exposed to it already. I, I didn't know that yet. So we have, we have great, a great network like the New River Keeper where if people see these things happening, their eyes start itching, their throat starts getting sore, and they know there's something wrong with the water and there's algae there, they can let us know, the River Keeper know, and we can put this out on social media so people can avoid that. They might not go kayaking there that day, they might go somewhere else uh, <coughs> and avoid that. Um, Nitrogen and phosphorus, we've been doing fairly well over the last few years. In fact, those have been coming down um, until recently, until after Irma happened. And things got stirred up with the hurricanes and, and, and the weather. Um, so while nitrogen and phosphorus are, are going, have been going down, they're still a problem. Uh, and, and we need to keep an eye on them. Particularly with biosolids. And I think uh, we're going to let Lisa Ryan will talk more about that because they, they, the river keeper has been doing some work with that. Um, and they are a, a you know, source for not just these nutrients but other contaminants as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to skip over some of these slides, but this, this kind of gives you an idea of when, we, when you have a bee map to address people, bacteria, um, you have these various agencies, the municipalities, and the beach. The, various uh, cities, uh, JEA, uh, FDOT, um, the Navy bases, they are all these responsible parties that try to do projects that reduce nitrogen and phosphorus going into the community and the health. And uh, down here this sort of gives you an idea of some of the projects that go on and the, the numbers of projects that go on each year uh, and, and how many are completed and how many are going on to try to reduce that. At the moment, the city of Jacksonville has, uh, I think it's 44 tons of nitrogen that they're supposed to have removed from the river by the end of the year. And uh, we don't know how that's going to happen. We don't think that's going to be achieved. 
However, a lot of these types of projects, and also there are some other projects that, are, that you know, 100 million has been spent on uh, septic tank removal on the north side of Jacksonville. Uh, those kind of things add credits that can go towards that. Uh, but I don't think that they're going to meet that that go that requirement. And, uh, so we'll have to see how, how that goes. Um, go to the next slide. This gives you an idea of those tributaries. So we have about 50, 54 tributaries all affected by high bacterial levels. And I know you can't see this really well on this slide, uh, but the shaded ones in gray are the ones that have BMAPs. Okay, so they have plans to reduce their problems. That means they all come off the impaired list. They're still impaired, but they come off that impaired list. So it gives you kind of a false sense of, oh, okay, these are being handled, but we still have this problem. Uh, go to the next slide. You'll see on the next slide, I kind of broke it down here. Seven of them on the left there have 100% exceedance. And those were the red numbers you saw in that table. And then about 12 of them are between 50 and 92% exceedance, and the remaining 10 are less than 50% exceedance. But the best one is Ortega River, which is 20 something, 21% exceedance. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. This is not an easy fix, it's an expensive thing to fix. One of the things we worry about is you can throw a lot of money at this, but can, are you going to see the results? Are you going to actually be able to tell where we're, we're making, a, you know, this is, this is cost benefit is actually worth it. Uh, one other thing you have to bear in mind is a lot of nutrients come from outside the basin into the basin. So they come from the middle basin and the upper basin of the St. John's River. Those nutrients are coming into the lower basin on top of all this. And so we may make some strides at removing a, a bunch of stuff, but we may not put a dent in the, in the problem in the, in the, in the issue. Um, so, and this is where the Riverkeeper comes in, trying to make coalitions that go across regions and counties is going to be necessary to try to achieve some things. Um, so you can see I put here in the coastal is in this area here with less than 50% exceedance which is this area, our areas around here at Atlantic Beach, uh, Neptune Beach, and so on. Okay, let's go to the next. How am I doing on time, by the way? You're doing great. Okay. A um, couple of things we look at when we break down the bacteria. We look at E. coli in freshwater, and we look at enterococcus in salt water. And that's really all I'm going to say about this right now. There are different levels that we look for over certain periods of time uh, to determine those values. But in the past, we used to just look at E. coli, and that didn't give us as good a representation. Also, there's a biannual assessment going on. So every two years, we look at all this, all the all the water, water the wibbits, all the water bodies, ID, water, water, water body ID. Um, and in the past, we used to wait, do this on a five-year cycle. So this is much quicker, much much quicker data coming in, much. Quicker. Should, we should be able to react to it quickly. So we're in the first two years of that biannual assessment, and so it's early stages, but it looks like when you compare the data from before to now, we're still in exceedance, and it's, it's, it's still a horrible picture. We still have to get better than that. Um, next slide. Okay, this is just sort of, let's go to the next slide. Same thing. Um, some work that's been done in the past looking at sourcing where this bacteria is coming from. Because some of it is from animal sources, and some of it is from wildlife, and some of it is from pets, and some of it is human, the sewage that's treated or untreated. And so this is actually old data, and I may have showed you this last year. So this is nothing new, but it kind of gives you an idea of where these efforts are taking place. Um, and you can see there's a number of places where we have human sewage that's being detected out there. And this is a, it's not a great picture, but this is all these blue dots and orange dots and green dots are our 60,000 septic tanks that we know of. There are more than, them out, more than that out there that we don't know of, but these are the ones that we know of. That, bear in mind, as sea levels rise, as our water table rises, these things may be more, more and more compromised. And so having policies that, you know, when you buy a house that has a septic tank, it has to have been inspected. Sell it. Things like that are, are important. Um, 
and to have it checked every so often. Because usually with our septic tanks, nothing really rises to the top until there's a problem. And then an inspection comes out and says, oh yes, you've got a leak, and then you have to do the fix, fix to it. It could have been leaking for years, for decades, and you know, so this, this is something that has to be fixed at some point. Uh, and this is just talking about those three neighborhoods on the north side. If you go to the next slide, uh, you may see uh, this, this is just, no, not yet, but this is Arlington, and there are a number of creeks in here in Arlington, and this is just showing you that there's a high correlation between those creeks that are all in 100% exceedance and the septic tanks that are in the area. A, and in fact, if you look at many areas of Jacksonville, it's like this everywhere. Next slide. Yeah. So some of these, and some of these are marine. So the green, the green areas are looking at the Enterococcus, which is that marine sort of uh, bacteria we look at, and then the other areas are all E. coli. You can see there's quite a few septic tanks along the for the coastal area. Thanks. So. And then there are SSOs. These are something that we like to look at too. SSO stands for sanitary sewer overflow. Uh, and so we get a, a number of these when we have events like storms that compromise the system, overwhelm the system. Uh, and you can see the years of the number of events that have occurred and they map them, the, the numbers of gallons spilled. Um, so this is some, you know, Jacksonville has old infrastructure. And some of that old infrastructure leaks uh, or breaks. Um, and so, the AEA actually has some technology where they can check their pipes and you know, So they're doing that and hopefully uh, fixing a lot of these leaks. But uh, 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 we're going to have stresses. As our chief resiliency officer always talks about, we have acute stresses, which is what this is, uh, and we have uh, chronic stresses. And so uh, we have to kind of bring those into the whole resiliency picture. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then the rest of my talk kind of goes into some of the graphs that show you the actual graphs and the numbers of what I've just been talking about. So I think maybe this is a good time for me to stop and, and let you take over and, and talk about how um, maybe we can have some solutions to, to some of these. Some hope. Absolutely. <laughs> some hope. Right. We all need hope. Thank you, Dr. Pinto. And that's reducing nutrient pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus. 
According to the River Report, the good news is we've made some progress in reducing nitrogen, but we are seeing some uptake in phosphorus. We'll talk a little bit about that. And one thing I was just thinking about, Dr. Pinto, that we could maybe add to the next year's report. One of the things we're seeing is there's a reduction of point source pollution, which is the pipes, and that's easily controlled, but we're seeing an increase in non-point source, and that's runoff from agriculture, um, as well as from septic tanks, and from re re using reclaimed water. A lot of times we use reclaimed water, which is a good thing, but if you're putting fertilizer, that's adding more nutrients. So that maybe is a conversation for uh, future years that we're seeing an increase in. Um, Hurricane Irma was a wake up call for us at St. John's Riverkeeper, as well as probably everyone in Northeast Florida, because when we had those floods following when Hurricane Irma, which was really just a tropical storm by, got, by the time it got here, 70 miles west of Jacksonville, the, the flood models did not predict what happened. This flooding event was much more substantial than anyone anticipated because of several things. There was a nor'easter that was keeping the water in the system, as well as the you know, water river levels are rising in the St. John's, and those had not been incorporated into the models. And so it was a wake-up call for us. Um, in 2022, last year, Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole, back-to-back -back hurricanes in Central Florida, they left us pretty well unscathed, but in Central Florida, it washed millions of gallons of raw sewage, not only into homes and people's businesses, but also into the St. Johns River. So we're anticipating more toxic blue-green algae this season as the temperatures heat up. Because when you have these flood events, all these things that are polluting the St. Johns River and our tributaries, there's more of it washing in in a higher concentration and washing down to the drain. So every day we need to make sure we're only putting rain down the drain because there are storm pipes aren't designed to filter these things out. But with these storms, we're seeing more pollution going into our system. And so we need to really focus on those challenges. Um, climate change is also impacting us in other ways. Many of y'all probably remember the coal ash spill just off the coast here. Um, and as we have, when that happened, it was due to a storm that popped up. So when you have more frequent storms, it makes us more vulnerable to pollution that's being shipped into our watershed, like this from Puerto Rico, which hundreds of thousands of tons of this is coming in every year, which doesn't make sense, but that's another conversation. But it makes us very vulnerable to these types of spills, as well as existing Superfund sites all in the St. John's River watershed. Anything is washing in. So we need to focus on um, dealing with these issues. And that's where we come in. Uh, we've been around for 23 years. We have a team of 10 professionals that work on this every day. One of our newest team members is Zariah. She's here uh, working with us. And very happy to have her efforts. Her background is in wetlands protection as well as compliance. And so she's going to help us protect wetlands and we'll talk about why that's so important in fulfilling our mission to defend and advocate for the St. John's. And it's not just the St. John's, it's all of the entire watershed. It's its tributaries, it's springs. The, the river is a spring-fed river. There's more than 100 freshwater springs that are part of the system. And so it's an important that we work with all of these areas. And we're also part of Waterkeeper Alliance. There's 350 of us around the world and 15 of us in the state of Florida. They work together on these issues. Um, and this is our jurisdiction. We cover the entire St. John's River watershed. It's more than 8,800 square miles. Um, it flows north. It, the headwaters is right down here. We were actually out on, on the headwaters just yesterday with some of our members down there that love the river just like we do. And it begins its river all the way down here in the headwaters in the very uh, in the swampy. It's very swampy. It's also it, it makes it's a series of lakes. So Blue Cypress Lake is the first lake in the system. And it makes its 310 mile journey all the way up to where it meets the Atlantic Ocean in Mayport, just south, just north of Jacksonville, and just north of where we are now. The river only drops in elevation 27 feet that entire 310 mile journey. That's why it makes lakes when she can swell into a lake, but it also makes it very lazy. And so it's very um, susceptible to pollution. When the pollution goes in, it sticks around for a long time because it doesn't flow very quickly. And it's also tidally influenced all the way down to that green star, just below the green star to Lake George. And so we're seeing sea level rise impacts all the, um, all the way down to Lake George. 
and pollution gets backed in. You know, the city of Jacksonville learned the hard that the hard way back in the 60s when they were pumping 15 million gallons of raw sewage into the St. John's River just north of the stadium, and the tide was just bringing it back into downtown. And so things stick around for a long time, and so we, we did, it's much more susceptible to pollution. And another thing that we're really just getting our head around is how susceptible as it is to sea level rise. Because the river's bottom is below sea level all the way down to um, Lake Hardy, which is right down to where the, green, the red star is. So we're seeing sea level rise impacts 200 miles inland. So when we talk about sea level rise, it's not just a coastal issue, it's an inland issue. And there was historic flooding after Ian last year, and Nicole, and DeLand, in Lake Hardy, the neighborhoods around there, and Astor, and Sanford. And again, that impacts us here, even though that's further south, because we're downstream, and all that pollution that washed in is negatively impacting our river. So we have to focus on this entire area. Um, the Green Star is the confluence of the Ocklawaha River and the St. John's, which is critical. We'll talk about in a minute. And the river report that we're talking about covers the last 100 miles from the Green Star all the way up to May Park. So um, there's a big area. We like to take people out to see these areas. If you ever want to go tour some of these different parts of the river, let us know. We'll have some, we'll have some tours coming up. Um, but again, as I mentioned, this is our litmus test. It tells us what, we're, what we need to focus on. Are we spending our limited uh, resources and energy in the right place? And I'll tell you what it's telling us. Some of you just heard from Jerry and what we are doing about it. Um, one is we talked about tributaries. Our river is only as healthy as its tributaries. This is actually from the Trout River and the Rebalt River, which is one of the most vulnerable tributaries in the lower basin due to two reasons. It has extremely old infrastructure. A lot of that infrastructure, the pipes that they do have are failing. A lot of areas don't have adequate storm system. And all of these dots are septic tanks. And so you have a lot of different things from the pollution side, as well as industrial sites in the area. And this area is also the most vulnerable to sea level rise because where it is in the St. John's, you know how the river it turns, it goes north after the stadium, and then it turns east to go out toward Bayport, um, just north of Arlington area. And the Trout River is right there in that turn. And so when we dredge the river and we deepen it, a lot of that increase in water level is going right up into the Trout River. And so when you look at the Army Corps models, it's, um, this area gets the most impact from the dredging as well as sea level rise. So that makes all this inadequate infrastructure more susceptible, as well as all the homes. So we're targeting this area to do a, a tributary project working with the community to advocate for more, um, uh, more infrastructure investment, as well as more working with the community to clean up their parks and uh, get more activities and, and just finding out what we can do to invest in this tributary as a pilot so that we can look at other tributaries and have, have, um, have more vulnerabilities due to infrastructure and sea level rise. Fortunately, there are these yellow dots, those are septic tank phase-out projects, so we are seeing some dollars invested into that area, so there is some positive movement. And it's been really great because there's some great waterfront parks that just have not been really um, invested in and, and, and populated, so we're doing activities with kids and adults. And if you ever want to come out and see some of those great parks, then we'd love to take you out there too. Jimmy, uh, I mean, Jerry mentioned sewage sludge. Um, sewage sludge is the appropriate word for biosolids, um, but if you talk about it to our legislators or the state, um, they call it biosolids. Biosolids bio is a very pretty word, it's a marketing word that describes the it, the solids that are, when we send our sewage to a wastewater treatment facility, they clean out the worst of the solids, and it's very concentrated human waste also commingled with very concentrated industrial waste. And so it's very high in pharmaceuticals and nutrients and heavy metals and forever chemicals and, and, um, and hormones. It has everything, the concentrated stuff that comes out of our wastewater treatment facilities. The utilities have to get rid of this somehow to get, clean up the wastewater treatment. It's just a byproduct of treating human waste. Um, and the cheapest way to dispose of it is on farmland. It is high in nutrients, so the farmers like it for fertilizer, 
But it's also very high in all of this other bad stuff. It's so bad that back in 2007, South Florida um, was advocated and the legislature banned this practice in South Florida. And so now South Florida is trucking their sewage sludge to the headwaters of the St. John's because our river's not protected. And so that's one of the reasons we're seeing a significant increase in the phosphorus in this area, the headwaters, as well as heavy metals and other things. We've been doing sampling around one of the farms that is, is doing this practice, and the, the water coming off of that farm looks more like industrial waste than off agriculture. And so it's a very bad practice. We've been working since 2018 to try to get equal protection, and the legislature basically says, well, it has to go somewhere. But why are we being forced to take South Florida's waste? Um, the good news is it's a little bit better. Um, they were trucking about 70,000 tons annually to our headwaters now. It's back down to 50,000 tons. And so we've been working for trying to figure out ways to use the law, to use science, and to the legislature to stop this practice. We've teamed up with the Public Trust for Conservation, probably many of you know, um, um, John November, and he was very close to getting a better bill past this legislative session, but unfortunately one of the farms that benefits it um, killed it at the last minute. But we will continue this because, it, one, it's, it's a permitted source of pollution in the St. John's, which is just mind-boggling. It's not our waste. It's coming from South Florida. And the second thing, it's not sustainable. Florida is growing at 1,000 people per day, and we have to have a sustainable plan to manage that growing volume of human waste that comes with it. So we'll continue our efforts, and uh, maybe John and I can come back sometime, and we can talk about how we can do that together. The other thing besides trying to stop pollution at its source we do is try to restore the river's ability to provide all the wonderful things our river should provide. And the way we do that is protect our wetlands and those submerged grasses. These grasses and wetlands are critical to the health of the, uh, of the St. John's River, but the River Report continuously is telling us that we're losing our wetlands and our grasses at an alarming rate, and we have to do more. Um, these grasses are the nurseries for everything we like to, um, to eat. So we like to recreational fish, our commercial fishery. It's the foundation of our thriving seafood industry. And so if we lose this habitat, then we're going to lose all of the things that we enjoy out of the St. John's River. In addition, they are the kidneys of the river. So if we are losing these grasses, which they are basically wiped out in the last hundred miles from Hurricane Irma, as, as Dr. Pinto mentioned, they haven't come back, but we lose that filtration, so we'll see more uh, toxic blue green algae like this one. In addition, those grasses and wetlands, they're sponges. They provide flood protection. And so when you lose those grasses, you lose the flood protection that goes with them. You can't mitigate flood, flood protection. So a developer may come in, they, they fill the wetlands, and they say, oh, we're going to mitigate for them you know, 30 miles away. Well, you just gave that area all that flood protection. And sometimes that's more of an accounting exercise than a real like for like. And so it's real important we protect what we have and restore what we've lost. Another threat to these grasses and wetlands is saltwater intrusion. As we've, as we've deepened our river, we've widened it and straightened it, not only have we created a superhighway for more cargo ships, we've created a superhighway for the Atlantic Ocean. And so we're seeing more water come into the system as well as more salt water. Um, we're also overusing in Central Florida our aquifer. So as we overtap our aquifer, we're seeing a reduction of spring flow, which means there's a reduction of fresh water. And if there's fresh, less fresh water coming into the system, it's being backfilled with more salt water. So as that salt water wedge goes further south, that's killing these submerged grasses. And we're also seeing an alarming rate of cypress trees dying. And the, the Army Corps projections are showing that we're going to start losing freshwater swamp and it's going to be replaced with salt marsh. And a lot of people say, well, I like salt marsh. That's great. The problem is, is this ecosystem is very fragile and it depends on a mix of fresh and salt water. And so about 90% of the organisms that we like to eat, they can like fresh water in some parts of their life cycle and salt in another, like blue crab. And they need both. And so they need to be close together. 
So we've got to work on protecting that natural balance of fresh and salt water, and also to help make sure we have that filtration. This is actually one of the most alarming photos that Dr. Pinto actually took when he was doing one of his manatee flyovers. And while I want to use this one just to show how toxic these outbreaks can be and how dangerous we don't let people know. This, I don't know if you see it, but this is an inner tube with about four little kids on it. And they are behind the boat, so not only are they going to fall off, they're going to drink these toxins, the, the wake is kicking up toxins, they're breathing it. So we went out and did a sample of this when we saw this photograph, and this outbreak was 300 times more toxic than safe recreational standards. And so it's truly a health issue on top of an environmental issue, and we've got to get to the source of the problem. So what do we do? We stop pollution at its source. But right now, and there's, there's regulation is still an ugly word, and right there are some movement to try to deal with the algae by using pesticides and algae sites, but they're not getting to the root cause. And so we have to all work together to make sure we have protections like against biosolids that are in sewage sludge coming from South Florida. We also can do our part. Each of us can reduce our fertilizer, our nutrient pollution footprint. We can conserve water to protect our aquifer. And so we have a whole river-friendly program that's kid-friendly. We have a kid-friendly, river-friendly program. Um, and there's also things if you're a boater, if you're, um, if you, whatever you like to do, we have different tips. You can find it on our website at safe.riverkeeper.org. And we also have programs that we can do on river-friendly. And by the way, being river-friendly is earth-friendly, so it's another, another advantage. Um, we need to be more resilient, working with our chief resilience officer, working with the coalitions like at the North uh, Regional um, uh, Council, which is working with all five counties up here. We have to reduce flooding into our waterways. That keeps pollution out. It protects our homes. It protects our businesses. And, we're, and use more green infrastructure. We can invest in using nature to protect our, our waterways like the Great Eagle Trail will do when it restores of Hogan's Creek and, and McCoy's Creek. It provides us beautiful spaces to enjoy in normal conditions, and then it will provide us protection in extreme conditions, and it filters out water, a new type of pollution to our waterways as well. And then we have to focus on the root causes of climate change. A lot of people think climate change is someone else's problem, but we're seeing warmer temperatures, warmer water temperatures, reduced dissolved oxygen. It, it makes algal blooms more, in, uh, more rampant. And so we're seeing more flooding, more frequent storms. So one of the things we're doing is, is we've joined up with Sierra Club and other organizations in a coalition called Renew Jacksonville. And we've been part of a stakeholder process working with JEA, asking them to commit to renewable energy. I'm happy to say they're doing better than they were. They have made some progress, but there's much more to be done. And we actually need to have a sense of urgency to get there. And the good news is, is renewable energy now is lower in cost. And so it actually makes economic sense. Um, they have committed, to, we've asked for them to commit to 30% renewable by 2030. They're getting up to 24%. Um, and we think that there's more to be done. We're actually having a brewery series next week in downtown Jacksonville on May 9th. Is that right? May 9th to Tuesday to talk about it over a beer with the Sierra Club. And on May 25th, there is a, a stakeholder meeting, a community meeting hosted by JEA, and I'll be on the panel to talk about that. And then the last thing I want to close before we open up for questions is one of the most important opportunities we have to tackle many of these issues we just talked about. The most important thing we can do for the St. John's River is to reunite Silver Springs, the Okawawa, and the St. John's. And I do want to again just say hi to Erin. Erin is one of our advocates working with us to reunite the rivers. Erin, um, you probably know her from her, her work with Oceana, and she's been working with Florida Defend, I mean Defenders for Wildlife, and uh, she's the chair of our communications um, committee for our Reunite the Rivers Coalition. Silver Springs is the largest tribute there, the largest spring that provides fresh water to the St. John's River. But unfortunately, it was dammed in 1968 as part of the failed Cross Florida Barge Canal. For decades, every politician wanted to build a canal across the state of Florida just like the Panama Canal. 
And fortunately, environmentalists, farmers, and others use science and the law to stop this canal. Um, there, uh, there's a long story about that. I don't have time. It's a great story. Uh, if you ever want to hear the rest of it, about a housewife from Micanopy that was armed with good science and a lot of good friends. But in 1972, President Nixon stopped this very expensive project. And so we, don't, we only have remnants of the cross border barge canal. But we also have a relic dam. The Rodman Dam, also known as the Kirkpatrick Dam, was, was already built and they left it in place. This dam is located in, in on the Okawaha River. So it basically severs the natural connection to from Silver Springs to the St. John's and the Okawaha, which is the largest tributary of the St. John's River. And it's a spring-fed river. There's about 20 springs that are in that are drowned out behind that pool. Um, but after this was built, it became, the pool became a popular bass fishing destination. And but it's never functioned as a natural lake. So every three to four years, they have to drain it like a fishbowl to clean it out. And when they do that, that causes additional harm to the St. John's. So every day, it's a place of harms to St. John's. Every day, every time they drain it, it harms. And it acts like a tourniquet. Like a, a tourniquet's on your leg, and after a while, if you leave the tourniquet on too long, you lose the leg. And what we're seeing is we, this is called severe damage to the St. John's, but that damage can be reversed by simply reuniting these natural systems. And so here's, let's see, what's the next slide I have here? And so that's why we've started the Reunite the Rivers Coalition, because not only will this help restore the St. John's, it helps restore everything we love about the St. John's River. By simply breaching the dam, it will restore 150 million gallons of fresh water to the St. John's River every single day. That influx of fresh water will help, help reinvigorate those lost submerged grasses that provide the filtration, the habitat. It'll all be able to improve water quality. The, uh, the Oklahoma is mostly spring fed, so it's warmer in the winter time. It's cooler in the summertime, so it regulates the water temperatures in the river, which is better. It provides habitat for manatees in a time of crisis. And it also restores the fishery downstream, not only in the St. John's River, but all the way out to the South Atlantic Bight. So it improves saltwater fishing as well as freshwater fishing. And in, in addition to the water quality benefits and the habitat renourishment, it also will, um, it, it, it also will, I just lost my train of thought, let me think. It also opens up the fish, the migratory patterns, the natural patterns for the fisheries to come up back into the Okawaha, where many rec uh, commercial fisheries like American eel, American shad, striped bass, um, and others actually need to go up, oh, Atlantic sturgeon, which is our logo. Um, you know, so it's really important to migratory fish, both saltwater and freshwater, and all of that will lead to uh, better economic development. The good thing about the drawdown that happens every four to, uh, three to four years to clean it out, not only does it provide us an opportunity to go see the springs come back and the fish to start flowing and the water to clear up and the trees, the cypress swamps, I forgot, it will restore 8,000 acres of forested wetlands, which are the best wetlands. It also has provided the University of Florida to do decades of analysis on economic data, and they project an 81% increase in visitation to this area if this restoration happens. So not only is the environmental benefit solid, the economic benefit is solid, and even with public opinion working in the local communities, this project has an approval rating of more than 74% in Putnam and Marion counties where it's the local base. And so this is by reuniting this system to the Akawa, to the Akawa Silver Springs, it'll benefit everything you see on this map from the Green Swamp to Marion County, Putnam County, Malacca, even in Lake George, and all the way to the, the South Atlantic Bight is the Great Florida Riverway. And so this is the thing that if we work together, we can make it happen. There is a drawdown scheduled to happen soon, so if y'all want to see these, this forest coming back, if you want to see the springs run, if you want to see the benefits to the St. John's, we'll be doing tours in the very near future, this fall and early next year, and I'm hoping to get this done in this legislative session. 
And then just wrapping up, um, to follow up uh, your conversation about voting, we believe that voting is patriotic and conservation is patriotic. We cannot endorse candidates, but we do have candidate surveys for, we've asked all the mayor candidates to do a survey as well as city council, and you can find those at our website, stjohnsriverkeeper.org, to find out their positions. And if you just want to get out and explore all these waterways, we have a new website called explorethesaintjohnsriver.com, and we have ideas from where you can just go do a hike, places where you can go get the best gator, or you want to take, have a cold beer on the water, or different parks, but ideas and places to explore throughout the 8,800 square mile watershed, and you can find that at Explore the St. Johns River. And if you find something that's not on that, let us know, we'll put it on there to let folks know. And with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Pinto back up, and so we can get some questions. And the Oklahoma come back. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that whole estuary. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, the, the, the St. John's River is an estuary all the way down to the Oklahoma near Wilaka, where it meets. This will revitalize and save our estuary. And it is that important. And it's not just uh, something we model or hope. No, no, it's scientifically proven. 40% of the, of the freshwater input to the St. John's River. It's the major tributary. And, and during the drawdowns, every federal agency and state agency, they've gone out and, and measured the spring flow. They've actually demonstrated and documented. So this 150 million gallons a day, it's not a model. It's an actual measurement, and that's the conservative limit. So it's significant. And it, it's no, there's no other way you could get this amount of fresh water back in the system unless you told Orlando to turn off all their water. Yeah, yeah. And that's not going to happen. Is there any possibility that you could get the citizens referendum on the ballot to get it removed? I mean, if you have enough, like Virginia or That is something that there's conversation. There, there, that's conversation. That's, Part of it is just the timing of it, and, and um, there is a drawdown happening. This, well, we think we're still <laughs> waiting on that, that confirmation. There should be a drawdown happening. It had, we haven't got the official notice, 
And, um, and so that, that timing of the drawdown, and it, it, it gives us the best opportunity for people to see it, to feel it, to understand how important it is. It's, it's so, very critical to have this, this particular drawdown is lower than the normal drawdown. There's a, there's, a, there's a report on the dam, and it's, 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 a, it's a danger, basically, to people. Uh, if it fails, there's a number of properties uh, that are in jeopardy. Flooding. Uh, well, flooding and, you know, people may die, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, so the, this drawdown will take the water much lower than normal so that engineering inspections can be done that will determine if it needs to be removed would it? Uh, but um, just aside from the environmental benefits, there, there's this danger to society too that, that has to be considered. Um, and to answer your question, Kevin, it's it's really it drives us all nuts. You're not alone. But don't give. I guess don't give up because no. we're closer than we've ever been. And with this coalition, yeah, I mean, with, with the public interest. You know, we used to five years ago. You know, I would, you know, I was afraid to wear St. John River Keeper shirts, you know, in Putnam County. And now everyone's like, we want to see this happen. They ask the same questions. I mean, they literally ask the same questions. And I sometimes say, well, it's Putnam County, and they're like, what? And I'm like, well, but it's all about us coming together to talk about what could be. And one of the best things is uh, Margaret Swantek, our coalition, past coalition chairwoman, she actually went to University of Florida and, and students came out and did workshops and talked to the local community about what they wanted to see. And they turned those ideas into renderings about what the breach dam can look like, but have it where it's breached. So it's not removing the dam, it's just removing the section where the river is. That will work. You know, take, that'll bring it back in the watershed. All of a sudden, you get the forest and floodplain back, and we'll be able to see this forest come back, and all the birds that will come back, and all the bird watching and wildlife. I mean, it will be a huge thing for us to be able to see. Not something that's going to take hundreds of years. We're going to see this happen right in front of us, and it will just take nature. It's very little of human activity. How how long is a drawdown time? Yeah. I mean. Months. Yeah, they, they start draining it down if they just do the regular schedule. Again, we're waiting on the official word. And so we're trying not to promote it too much because we want to get the official, official word. Um, but they're talking about they usually to start drawing down in October. And it depends on rainfall, how quickly the springs start flowing. But typically by December, historically speaking, you can start seeing the blue springs come back. You can start, and then when the trees get exposed, you start seeing the baby cypress coming back. And then from January, February time frame is the prime time to see it. Um, and it's magical. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of bittersweet because you go out there and you know if you're, it's going to be lost. In fact, there's a film called The Lost Springs of the Oklahoma that's incredible and it shows you what it looks like. And one of the, um, you can also fly over and see all the blue springs start flowing, but you can see the water get clearer and warmer in the wintertime. Um, but it's it's just it's it's unbelievable how nature just wants to return itself, and all we have to do is give it a little boost. Um, and the community surrounding wants it, as well as the community downstream. It's just we got to get Tallahassee to be in the right place. What's that? Probably Disney Oh. <laughs> and uh, you know the other thing too is it's an enormous expense to maintain it and try to keep it going as it is. How many river managers are there in the state of Florida, and do they have similar issues for St. John's River? Yes, so there's 15 waterkeeper groups in the state of Florida, um, and we actually formed as Waterkeepers Florida in 2018, so we can have a state voice because we are there's very similar issues with climate change, um, sea level rise, nutrient pollution, toxic blue green algae. Um, what other wetland loss? Um, so I, we're very fortunate to have amazing water keepers. There's about 170 of us across the country. There's 350 of us around the world. We all work together in an association. But I think Water Keepers Florida, we meet every week. And what's great about it is our skill sets are different. 
our chairwoman, she's the Matanzas Riverkeeper, and she's fresh out of law school, and well, she's been with us five years now, and she's just a dynamo in you know, using the law to help us all with our issues and following legislation. Um, we have engineers, we have, um, we have a, 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 a coral biologist, a, a, the Miami Waterkeeper has a doctorate in, in coral work, and so our expertise collectively, all 15, is really phenomenal, and I've learned so much from all of our water keepers. But it's given us a voice at the state level, um, which I wish I could say we've got more legislation passed, but I can't say we've stopped some really bad stuff. And so we've been on the defense more, and we're trying to flip to get on the offense. If you, if you look at uh, around the world, many urban environments are all suffering from the same problems we're having here. Um, if you take places like London, for example, where all the tributaries have been covered, they're all underneath the, you know, you can't see them. So some of the projects that are happening in, in Jacksonville are actually daylighting rivers that before they get covered, or tributaries before they get covered. So those are good things going forward. So changing this paradigm and getting people to think about working with water as opposed to trying to engineer out of problems all the time. Working with nature uh, saves money down the road. You may spend a lot now you'll spend 10 times, 20 times that down the road trying to fix it you don't, don't work it with it, age. And, and luckily now for us, there's a lot of um, documented success using green infrastructure. And um, there's one, you know, Urban Land Institute has several documents where they can, and I've passed them out to elected officials, um, you know, how we can invest and get a better return on incorporating green and methane infrastructure along with gray. It makes our, our pipes work better. And so um, harvesting the value of water is one of my favorite. Just harvesting the value of water. It's different cities that have used green infrastructure. But they show that return on investment is there um, to justify because sometimes the green infrastructure may cost a little more up front or they may be perceived to have more of a maintenance cost um, but it's demonstrating it's, it's, it's cost effective. Same with solar. Solar has come down dramatically um, so there's lots of opportunities there um, that we're excited about too. So, so the, the main point I'd like to make is that we need to start thinking about solutions more than us just show you graphs and how bad things are you know, why would that happen? And so, if there's any opportunities uh, to see projects that are showing results, we need to market that. We need to get the word out so people can see, okay, if we do this with McCoy's Creek, this is what we can benefit of. If we do this with the Oklahoma, this is what we can make things look like going forward. So that's, that's very powerful. All right, well, thank you. We're a little Mark your calendar for our next meeting, June. So it's good, bad, the ugly.